Welcome everybody to today's live webinar, Discover, Explore, Train and Work, an innovative approach to youth engagement in the trades. My name is Racine DeBartolo and I will be your host. CAF research shows that there are multiple challenges to youth engagement in the trades. Fewer apprentices under the age of 25 are participating in apprenticeships, and once youth leave high school, they are not easily accessible to educators or other career awareness practitioners. There is limited knowledge about the apprenticeship training pathway, and apprenticeship stakeholders discuss a need for more teachers and guidance counselors to learn about skilled trades and apprenticeship and promote it to their students. That's why I'm very pleased to welcome Jason Lieber from the Industry Training Authority, or ITA, in British Columbia. The ITA oversees youth trades programs in BC's K-12 education system, and Jason's going to share their innovative program that has addressed challenges with youth engagement. Jason is the manager of youth programs and has an automotive service technician, Red Seal, and provincial instructor's diploma. He has over 16 years experience as an instructor, curriculum developer, and manager of trades education in post-secondary and corporate training. We're very happy to have him joining us live today, so welcome, Jason. Thanks, Jason. It's great to be here. Okay, so we're going to uh, go through all of the youth programs that we offer here at the ITA and give some perspective to everybody about how we structure the programs and how we uh, we work with all the stakeholders in British Columbia to get youth into trades. A little background about ITA, if you're not already familiar with us, we oversee all the trades in British Columbia, and we report to the Ministry of Advanced Education, Skills and Training. We also uh, work with the, the industry stakeholders to help create a, a path for youth into trades to meet the demands for jobs in BC. Over the next 10 years, we're forecasting about 100,000 jobs in trades, and about half of those jobs will be filled with new entrants into the workforce, and for us, that means youth coming out of school and entering into trades. So one of our targets then is to meet that demand with youth, and that's about 5,000 youth every year we're looking at engaging in our youth apprenticeship trades programs, and that's to meet that demand. So I'm gonna walk through then how we do that and how we structure our programs to, uh, to achieve that 5,000 every year. Now we do that through our dedicated youth team. Our overall annual budget is about 8.3 million and that's funding that supports our programs with school districts, uh, First Nations and also independent schools. We also have about uh, a half a million dollar operating budget um, to also support uh, our staff and the outreach activities that we do with school districts and stakeholders. The way we've structured our team is under the Department of Training Investment, and so Paulette Sangalang is our director. We have two outreach um, workers in our team, so Lisa and Maureen. They do a lot of the engagement with school districts and stakeholders. They, uh, they coordinate the, stra the strategies that school districts are implementing in their district. They do a lot of sharing of best practices, and since it's such a large province and, and quite spread out, um, we're kind of that conduit between all of the different training providers and and school districts to share what's happening in different parts of the province. We also have uh, Randy, who's our administrator, and she handles all of our invoicing and our registrations for the youth programs. With 5,000 students every year engaging, it creates a lot of students to track and to monitor their progress and then to report also on our, our statistics. And with all youth programs, you know, we need, have to have youth that are engaged in the program. We have to have stakeholders, like the school districts who are engaging with the the students, but also we need industry to support those apprentices and give them the opportunities. So we've connected with our own team, our uh, industry relations team, and we've got Sean there who handles all the youth aspect of that. And so he's out working with industry to get them on board to support our youth program. To give you a snapshot of BC, so you can put some perspective in case you're from one of the other jurisdictions to to make some comparisons there, you can see what our population is, almost 5 uh, million people in BC. Our K-12 population is really who we're engaging with from the youth perspective. And we've got about half a million students enrolled in the school program across BC. For all of our youth programs, we get about 18,000 students a year that are having some touch point with the trades program. So there's a lot of students that participate in our programs that we don't actually register into an apprenticeship, and that's where you'll see that large number. 
our main participants in our programs really are our senior high school students, the grade 10 to 12. For most reasons, uh, like other provinces, once students get to that age in school, that's when they can start choosing electives and they have more autonomy over their own schedule. So it makes it easier for them to participate in a trades program. It also allows them to start preparing for that transition to post-secondary education. So of those students, 150,000 in that grade 10, 11, 12 range, that's where we're really trying to engage that 5,000 number. So we work closely with them. One of the unique things that we've been able to do in BC is, is use our youth definition to allow all students who are school age to register in a trades program. So the impact that has and what it means is any student who is of school age can start a trades program. It doesn't require a student to have graduated or it could also allow a student who's graduated to begin a youth program. And what that does is allows the student to do a full academic K-12 program, graduate, and then enroll in a trades program. So it keeps both doors open for students. It's not a choice that they need to make, either a university path or a trades path. They can do both, and we really encourage students to do that. So a student can register in any of our programs up until June 30th of the school year that they turn 19. So for most students, that gives them at least one extra school year past graduation to participate in our programs. Our programs are shaped like a funnel. And uh, I'm going to go into each one of these in more detail as we get into the webinar. We, we have sort of a grassroots program, and we call that Youth Discover. And the Discover program has two streams. There's the Maker Way and there's Discover the Trades. And we'll get into explanations about how each of those work. And that's really about the broad reach. Those are mostly in the younger ages, and it's about putting some tools into students' hands, getting them that chance to learn and experience trades. The idea being is as they then progress into middle school and early high school, they can start to look at trades programs a little bit more, uh, with a little bit more of a background and some experience. When they get into grade, say, 9, 10, 11, that's where they would participate in one of our Explore programs. At this point in our ITA portfolio, this is where we start to register students and track their progress. So the 5,000 students you can see on the left side there, that's from the Explore program, the Train program, and the Work program. So Explore program is literally that. It's about trying out some different trades. It's exploring a path into trades and learning about trades. After that, they might select a trade to pursue further into an apprenticeship stream. And that's where Youth Train in Trades and Youth Work in Trades come in. Both of those represent an apprenticeship. So as with most jurisdictions, an apprenticeship is 80% work-based training and 20% technical training. So that's represented there. So youth train and trades is the technical piece, and the youth work and trades is the work-based training, the hours piece. So we'll get into each of those programs, and I'll answer some, some of the questions that you might have about them. So looking at our Discover model, if we start first with the earliest age program, that's Youth Discover the Trades. What we're trying to do here is engage elementary students and early middle age, or sorry, middle school or early high school students into a, an activity where a student would be building something, would be working with industry, um, having some sort of trades experience. Often they're run as a one-day event, and they usually involve multiple classes from the school district, would come to one school, and they would participate in this program. Some of the pictures that you see there are using mentors, either from the community, so either parents or uh, industry partners that have come to the school, brought some tools and equipment and resources, and they're running the program. Or in the top picture on the left, that's a, a high school um, shop student who's mentoring an elementary student and giving them that shared experience about why they got into a trades program and then helping them build a project. In the Youth Discover the Maker Way, this is all about design thinking. What's happened in British Columbia over the last a uh, couple of years is the high school, or sorry, schools from K to 12 have redesigned their curriculum. And the new curriculum incorporates a lot of design thinking and cross-curricular activities. So that's really exemplified in the making uh, process and in the Maker Way movement. So we fund programs for school districts to, again, bring together students from a particular grade across the district and run an event in the district. We've also done a lot of teacher education, so we've been upskilling teachers and providing some professional development. We've partnered with University of British Columbia Okanagan 
to lead that uh, the professional development piece. A lot of this has been around the new change in curriculum and how do teachers get on board and learn these new skills to teach design thinking in the classroom. And so this Discover the Maker Way program has really been enabling that. What we've also learned from industry is that the top three skills in demand of youth entering the workforce is to have complex problem solving skills, critical thinking skills, and also creativity. And all three of those are really the core in design thinking and the maker way. So that's been a really great way for us to engage in to these elementary programs and get kids building in a really fun way. I'll share with you our funding model for these grants. And we give school districts grants of up to $4,000 for one of these events. And the school district often has uh, contributions of their own or industry also contributes some funding or resources to run these events. These can be as small as 40, 50 students in event to events where we get, you know, four or five or 600 students attending them. It's really up to the school district to decide how they want to run this and, and what scale they want to do. I've also shared with you a lot of resources, so I encourage you after to download the presentation and access the links. We've created a lot of resources that teachers have developed for other teachers. There's a lot of lesson plans, there's mapping to our curriculum in BC, and there's also some, some suggestions about different activities that you could do in your school district um, to help kids engage through one of these programs. So now students have come through the Discover program and they've entered high school. Now they're really thinking about career paths and possibly pursuing a career in trades. They've got now an opportunity to try out some different trades and explore a little bit deeper. There's two paths for students to do this through the Youth Explore. And we've got Youth Explore Trade Skills, which is a high school model. And we've got Youth Explore Trade Sampler, which is based on a post-secondary model. The high school model, Youth Explore Trade Skills, is based around one block. So a student would do a 120 hour course and it would be either over a semester or a linear school over the whole school year and they'd be doing one course in that. And of that, it would typically work where they do one core 30 hour module in safety and orientation and some employability skills. And then they would do three different trades each at 30 hours. And some of the trades that they can choose from is automotive, carpentry, electrical, plumbing, design and drafting, metalwork, and robotics and electronics. And just this year, we've added two more trades to that. We added baking and we added cooking. So there's quite a comprehensive list of the most common trades that we get in BC. And each one of those trades has full course curriculum mapped um, about the trade linked to our program standards to give students a, an idea about what they could be doing in that trade, giving them real hands-on exposure in a school environment. And that's been a very popular course, and I'll give you some statistics later on about how many students we get registered in each of these, but that program alone has almost doubled participation in the last few years. The next program students can also choose from, and they may do both of these programs, or they may just choose one or the other would be the secondary version. And the secondary version is very similar, except it's longer in duration. It's, uh, it's worth three different courses. So they get three course credits for that versus the one for the high school model. They also get workforce certificates. So students that graduate out of here also get first aid, they get WMIS, and they also get one other certificate that the training provider chooses to give the students, and that would depend on demand in their area. The post-secondary version also includes a little bit more uh, essential skills and employability skills, and it also helps to prepare them for that transition into an apprenticeship, a little bit more in-depth than we would see in the high school version. And with these programs here, students typically would leave high school and go to a post-secondary for that, uh, for the three courses, and other programs may be partnered where the post-secondary would come to the high school and deliver the training in the high school. So we see lots of different versions of that. I'll share with you some of our funding model. So with the high school version, those are mostly funded through the Ministry of Education. It's a high school course that uh, is delivered by high school teachers. And so we fund them with $100 for every student that registers into the program. 
We registered the student into our ITA database, and so now we're tracking the student through their apprenticeship. The $100 goes back to revenue of the school district and can be used to purchase some of the consumables and, and the resources that are needed to deliver these trades programs, which tend to be fairly expensive for a school district to deliver. The secondary version program, the trade sampler, we give $250 for every student because those ones have more tuition around them. So if the post-secondary is delivering the programs, they're charging the school district a tuition fee, and that then the $250 offsets some of that tuition cost. We also provide the post-secondary some seat funding, and I didn't include that in here because it's, it's blended into our training plans for the post-secondaries. That represents about $2,000 for every student uh, to take a program. So we fund the post-secondary for delivering that. Again, I included some more links to resources. So the resources for each one of those trades that I talked about through the high school model, you can find that under that teacher resource link. And for the trade sampler program, you will find um, a program outline which maps all of the different curriculum pieces um, that the students are required to, to complete through that program. So that's all mapped for you and you can download that from our website. Now after doing an explore program, the students would hopefully have then picked one trade that they would have found really suited them and, and met their, their sort of desire to continue on with as a career. And so now they're starting into an actual apprenticeship. So the apprenticeship is split into you know, the work-based piece and it's also split into the technical training piece. So youth train and trades is the technical part of an apprenticeship. So there's two ways they can do that. Either they can do it through taking a foundation program at a post-secondary, or they can do it through block training release at a post-secondary. And either one is, is completing their first level of their technical training for their apprenticeship. Students are registered through ITA as an apprentice, and we track them now as a foundation student, and they get a trade worker ID number, and we can see their progression on through trade, same as we did with the Explore programs. These are dual credit programs, so students are getting credit towards high school. They also get credit towards their apprenticeship. And for this, there generally is about 12 courses that students are completing. So most of our foundation programs are about 24 weeks in length and the students receive the equivalent credit for that in their high school uh, graduation. So these are pretty significant courses for students, and generally a student would do this as a second semester of grade 12. Um, some students will start it in grade 11, but most of them will probably do it in grade 12, and now they can also do it after grade 12. So this is where I was talking about earlier. A lot of students will graduate from high school and now they'll participate in the apprenticeship program and they'll go to a college and do a foundation. So we're seeing that occur across the province. We also do have some high schools who have become designated training providers. And what that allows is the school district to do all of the training within their own school and not send the kids off to a college to do a foundation program. We see this often as a good choice for school districts around some of the construction trades. So carpentry, electrical, plumbing. Uh, we do see this in cooking and hairdressing quite a lot. And automotive is another one. Uh, that we do get requests for. It also helps provide some flexibility for the students in transportation where that can be a barrier. We don't need to have students you know, going off to a post-secondary every day, which can be a barrier in some communities. The photo that you see there of that, uh, the class of students standing in front of that little house is a great example of one of our best practices that we like to share. This was at Guilford Park in Surrey and they run a, a carpentry foundation program, it's a youth train and trades program. And the students in this program build small houses and they have the design and drafting students working with the homeowner who is, is working with them to design the house that they would like. They then engage with the um, electrical foundation program, electrical train and trades, and also the plumbing train and trades program and the carpentry program. They partnered with the tool supplier to provide them with brand new tools every year. And they build these small houses and so they run it like a work site. They coordinate with all the sub trades and they get these houses built in one semester, which is about half a school year, um, at the high school. One of the really unique things about this program is they run it like a job site in the sense of they bring in porta potties, they make the kids pack their lunches for the full school day, 
and they run them just like they would experience at a work site, which is different than a high school. What that allows them to do is really prepare them for the workforce. And at the end of the year, they have a, a graduation barbecue. And at the barbecue, employers are there performing job interviews with the student, and they're hiring them on the spot at the end of graduation. And the employers have told us that it's one of the most successful programs, and that's where they hire students out of because they really help prepare them for that transition into the workforce. So it's really one of our, uh, our key programs that happen in this province and some great successes around it. Now the funding model for this program is a little bit more complicated. It's one of our largest programs. Over four and a half million dollars every year goes into this one program from our youth budget. We fund the school districts a couple of different ways. So we give them a registration payment when they register up front, so that $1,200 for every student that they register. When the student completes the program and passes the academic requirements of the program, we give them $1,000 as an incentive to get the right student in the program and help them with all of the supports that are needed to succeed in that program. And so there's $1,000 tied into that at the end of it. We also give the school districts a $500 uh, grant if they register students in this program, but also register them in the apprenticeship program, which I'm going to talk about next, called Youth Work and Trades. So that extra incentive is there, $500, because we know that students who do both of these programs are more likely to continue into trades. So we're trying to encourage school districts to do more of that and get students working in the trades as well. I included some links in the bottom there so you can download the program guide which really outlines all of the details to do with this program. Now we're hoping that students will also transition out of that technical piece and work in the trades. So the youth work in trades is the work-based component of the apprenticeship. So now they're collecting hours towards their apprenticeship. And if students do both of these, this, this program and the terrain and trades program, that's where we're seeing a lot more success and continuation. I'll share that statistic with you shortly. So here this program works with, there's four different courses a student can do while they're in school. They can start this program um, as early as grade eight or grade nine, as soon as they're of working age in BC. There's four courses they complete. Each course is worth 120 hours. So that 480 hours is what we consider to be completing uh, this program. Now students can continue on and they can collect more and more hours as an apprentice, which is fine. They just don't earn any more credit towards high school the four uh, courses is most credit they can earn. If students complete 900 hours plus meet academic requirements, they're eligible for a $1,000 cash scholarship. And uh, we call that an award. The award is split between us at ITA and also split between the Ministry of Education. We contribute half of that funding to it. So students receive a check uh, for $1,000 after they complete 900 hours and meet their academic requirements. And we've seen that as a big incentive for youth to continue on into trades and keep working beyond their graduation year. This program is funded uh, a couple of different ways and mostly it's funded through a block fund that we give school districts. And what we do there is we don't pay per registration of a partnership. Instead what we do is we give school districts either twenty, thirty, or forty thousand dollars which is based on the size of their school district, and the number of students they have in grade 10, 11, and 12, which is really where this program is aimed. That funding then goes to the school district to help pay for a staff member to be released as a non-enrolling teacher. So they're not standing in front of a class all day. They're out instead working with industry. They're engaging with employers. They're working with students in the school district, working with other career educators to help find students who are interested in pursuing an apprenticeship and then getting their registration paperwork in order and getting them signed up as a youth apprentice. So that's really where most of our funding goes towards, is towards staffing. We also give the $500 for any dual registered student. So that's one who does this program and also does the train and trades program. We also support school districts by giving them $1,000 to have a regional meeting. So the goal there is to bring in employers from their region, bring in representatives from other school districts, and have a meeting to discuss about ways to expand youth programs and engage employers into the schools and help support them. And so we provide some funding to have those meetings and just to pay for some of the costs of 
facility rentals for a hotel boardroom or pay for a lunch and those types of costs. We also recognize school districts with $5,000 in a performance award and we do this annually. We recognize the top school districts in each of the eight regions in BC and that is really to encourage school districts to register as many youth as they can in these programs and to support them to help the students get a valuable apprenticeship experience and also to complete their apprenticeship. And so that $5,000 goes to the school district and can be reinvested back into their youth programs to support further youth getting into trades. And then the last one there is about the $1,000 scholarship I spoke about earlier, and that award is for students. So there's some details around the, uh, the program, how it works, and the eligibility for the different pieces of it. And that's the link that, uh, that I provided there. Over uh, an average school year, we get about 700 uh, sponsors for our youth. And so every year we get 700 new uh, adult, or sorry, not adult sponsors, uh, 700 new employer sponsors sponsoring youth uh, for this program. So it's a pretty significant uh, program. One of the other places that we also get a lot of registrations from is our school districts often ask students in September uh, what they did over the summer and if they had a summer job and what they've been, where they've been working. And what they're doing there is they're finding out hidden apprentices. So there's a lot of youth that are working either for family businesses or for friends um, or working with an employer in a trade, but they're not registered as an apprentice. So if they are working in a trade and they're working with a certified uh, a sponsor or with a tradesperson and they're getting experience in trades, then what they can do is uh, they can get signed up as an apprenticeship and get record for those hours that they worked over the summer or previously. They get recognition for that. So a lot of school districts do that as a way to now find out who in their school district is actually working in trades outside of school and now they can provide them extra support and help them get into uh, that career and get through their technical training. So that's another significant area where we do find a lot of registrations. I want to share with you a resource that you can access um, after here. You, we've included this as one of the handouts. There's two different versions of this PowerPoint, uh, or sorry, this PDF as a takeaway. And this is something that uh, we use as a takeaway for educators, career educators and school districts. We also use it for parents to show them what a typical career path could look like for their youth. And it helps map out the different courses and the experiences that, would they, that they would have as they go through their school stream. So it summarizes essentially all of our youth programs, starting from the earliest age here where we've got the Discover program, a student is getting some hands-on experience, to then taking an industrial design course, which is a Ministry of Education class through their technology education. After that, they would sample different trades through the Youth Explore Trade Skills, which is our high school program. Then at that point, hopefully they've identified a trade that would you know, excite them and, and get their interest in a particular area to which they can begin an apprenticeship program through the Youth Train and Trades and complete their technical training. After that, they could register as a Youth Work and Trades or they can also do them concurrently. That's an option too. So they could then collect their work-based training hours as a Youth Apprentice. After they've finished that, they would then graduate into the Adult Trades Apprenticeship Program and they would complete off their second, third, and fourth, or fifth levels of their apprenticeship program to complete their Red Seal or their certification. And then this also highlights some, some further career education that they can do. So as we all know, you know, trades doesn't end just with your certification. That's usually where it begins and you start building on that. And so here we're showing that you can go back and get more endorsements and more certificates and take your career in a different direction still within that trade. And so we're showing parents that you know, the trade is not the end, it's actually the beginning and here's your path into trades. So this has been a nice handout and a way to capture that uh, in one sheet. So this is a takeaway for you that you can download at the end of the presentation. Here's a summary of some of our registration numbers. So you can see roughly how many students we get in a typical school year in each one of our programs and some of our targets for this school year. So the Youth, Youth Explore Trade Skills Program is our high school version program. So last year we had 1,466 students in that and that has grown from two years ago where we had 800 students in that program. 
And once we started giving the $100 incentive to register students in that program, what we saw were a lot of schools that were offering, um, say, a, a woodworking class um, or an industrial education class, they shifted their curriculum to the trades component. So now they're doing carpentry, electrical, and plumbing. And it's often the same students that would have taken a shop class, but now they're getting trades experience and trades exposure and possibly now moving more into a trade than they would have before. So that funding and the change in curriculum has really enabled that one program to grow quite a bit. This year we're targeting 2,000 students and we'll be pretty close to, uh, to re uh, reaching that. And we think that next year where we've included the baking and cooking now, uh, that we're gonna grow that even more. The Explore Trade Sampler, which is the post-secondary version of that, we fund roughly 39 of those programs across the province every year. And we've been growing those each year. And this year, um, we're targeting about 570 students. And we were looking at about, I think it's about 44 or 45 programs across the province. Youth Train and Trades has been pretty consistent year over year in registration. It's about 2,100 students every year register into that program. And that's a student doing a foundation program. We don't forecast much growth in that area. A lot of that growth is capped by foundation seats that are available on the post-secondary side. And so that's been a, a fairly um, sustainable and, uh, and consistent program year over year. The Youth Work and Trades, which is our apprenticeship program, that one there is, is limited to the number of adult sponsors that we can have who are sponsoring our youth. And here we, we're hoping to get more growth. We're really investing a lot of resources and, uh, and time into this program, trying to get school districts to build these programs up, get the right staff in place, and to get engaged with their employers. So we've been seeing around 1,100 students a year in that with about 700 sponsors for those 1,100 students. And we're forecasting some incremental growth in that program. So it's been sustainable. It's been very consistent and we're looking at ways that we can engage with more apprenticeship uh, programs and more sponsors. Now some of the other metrics that we look at here too is our pass rates. So we look at how many students are taking that youth train and trades program and are passing it, which means that the school district is receiving the thousand dollars for every student who passes that program. And we've seen that number come up quite a bit. It was down in the uh, sort of mid 60s for a while. And then we've been helping school districts in, in sharing some best practices around supporting uh, students, how to select the right students for the program. And also by having these explore programs before, give students that chance to try out trades and get a good sense for the right trade. So now students are doing some of that filtering before and they're not using the train and trades program as a way to try a trade out. So that's proven to be a very successful strategy and we're seeing our pass rate increase we also look at our completion rate for youth work and trades, and that's how many students are completing 480 hours. And we look at that number, um, I, we give them um, a year after they've graduated out of that program to get their hours in. And so we're seeing about 68% of those students are completing, which is a pretty high number when you think about how many students are working and continuing and accumulating those hours while they're still in school. It's a lot for a, a youth to take on. And then we also track our um, continuation on into trades. And here you can see how many students are continuing on into the next activity of their trades program from each one of our programs. So we look at continuation from train and trades and continuation from work and trades. And the most significant number there is the ones who have done both programs. So that's why we give the extra $500 for every student who is registered in both programs and that is really to encourage them to get them registered as an apprentice working in trades while they're doing their technical training or vice versa, because they're much more likely to continue on into the trades. So we've also seen quite a bit of success uh, through that, and those numbers have all been picking up uh, year over year as well. So there's lots of things that we also do uh, to connect on social media and marketing and, and to promote youth programs in British Columbia. So I encourage you to have a look at our website there, our youth.itabc.ca website. There's lots of resources for, uh, for the public to look at, like parents and students to explore trades and to learn about different trades. We also have a big section for educators 
where we've got a lot of our teacher resources that they can access, and then also some information for employers and some mentions about uh, different incentive grants and tax grants for employers to sponsor youth. We're also very active on social media, so please follow us, uh, check out our social media channels, and you can engage with us there. And you can also email us through our, our website. There's some links to email us, and our email address is youth at itabc.ca. So feel free to reach out with us uh, if you want to engage further on. So that's the summary of our youth programs in British Columbia. And thanks for uh, taking the time today to join us. We appreciate that. Thank you so much, Jason. I did want to share some resources uh, that we have here at the Canadian Apprenticeship yeah. Forum. So we've conducted uh, a lot of research over the years related to youth engagement. If you go to the CAF website, uh, you're going to find apprenticeship analysis on youth, educator, and parent perceptions of careers in the skilled trades. Additionally, uh, we have reports on the high school to apprenticeship transition, identifying and sharing best practices. Um, another apprenticeship analysis on the benefits of skilled trades career uh, perspectives from journey persons. And you'll find a regional roundtable summary called Building Blocks for Youth Success in the Trades. And this was a roundtable that we hosted in partnership with Skills Canada at the National Skills Competition in Winnipeg in 2017. And we discussed competency areas for apprentice success and identified gaps in youth readiness. Uh, so again, these three reports are available on the CAF website. One report that I really wanted to highlight today is a brand new report. We just posted it uh, this week called Youth Plus Jobs Equals a Better Future. Uh, in 2017, CAF hosted three regional workshops in British Columbia, Nova Scotia and Ontario, as well as one national conference in Ottawa. Youth were recruited from local high schools, mostly in grade 10 to 12. This report is a result of these workshops and provides key insights into youth perceptions, barriers, and provides solutions to help the apprenticeship community engage youth. It's now available on our website. In partnership with Skills Canada, ICAF's also created an excellent resource for parents, teachers, and youth to explore skilled trades key careers. It's called careersintrades.ca. We're currently in the process of redesigning the site, and the new site will be available in June 2018. On the Careers and Trades site, uh, there are many free resources available, uh, including the Educator and Apprenticeship Guides, which you see here, uh, and these are available for free download. Additionally, you'll find an interactive Prezi that explains apprenticeship and skilled trades careers. This can be used to provide presentations in classrooms or simply share the link with students and allow them to self-navigate. We've also created a series of Careers and Trades videos, which are available on the CAF YouTube channel. These videos interview young apprentices and journey persons and provide insight into their path through the trades. Just before ending the webinar today, I'd like to share some of our current initiatives and projects that CAF is working on. We've got two upcoming webinars. Uh, on May 16th, we'll host Apprentice Perspectives, Workplace Training in the Skilled Trades. Uh, this is a result of a survey with our Apprentices in Canada ePanel. So join this live webinar to hear perspectives on workplace orientation, supports, mentoring, and communication, and learn what factors help support apprentice retention and completion. On June 5th, we will host Supporting Women in Trades. Across Canada, there's a renewed focus on how to engage women in skilled trades careers. At this webinar, we'll share data and insights about the current state of affairs among women in traditionally male-dominated trades. You can find more information on how to register on the CAF website. Registration is open for our biennial national conference. Uh, this conference brings more than 500 of the apprenticeship community's most passionate stakeholders together from across the country. The program focuses on innovative initiatives, promising practices, and the latest research that the Canadian apprenticeship community has to offer. We're very excited to announce our inaugural Supporting Women in Trades Conference. So we do hope you'll save the date uh, from November 6th to 7th, uh, when we'll be in Halifax, Nova Scotia. This event will highlight initiatives, strategies, and innovative approaches underway to support women in the skilled trades.
Up to 300 delegates from across Canada will come together to share promising practices and learn from innovative programs. Participants will help identify the major challenges facing female tradespeople and the organizations serving them. Insights gathered at this event will be used to help inform policies and advocate for sustainable funding to attract and retain women in the skilled trades. Lastly, I'd like to tell you about the Apprentices in Canada ePanel. It collects insights, ideas, and feedback of apprentices using online surveys, helping to identify new ways to overcome training and workplace challenges. Multiple reports are available on the CAF website as a result of the ePanel, and we're asking the community to help us recruit apprentices to participate. Please contact Emily Aerosmith for more information. The Canadian Apprenticeship Forum is a national nonprofit organization that connects Canada's apprenticeship community. We influence pan-Canadian apprenticeship strategies through research, discussion, and collaboration, and promote apprenticeship as a valuable form of post-secondary education to youth, parents, and employers. Thank you very much for joining us today, and be sure to join us on our online community. Have a great day.